Good evening and welcome to this Facebook Live event to celebrate the start of Nat Geo Wild's Big Cat Week. Certainly worthy of celebration because I've got to tell you, we've got an extraordinary selection of films that are going to be running this week about some of the world's most intriguing, fascinating and charismatic animals. We are drawn to big cats, we naturalists, of course, from a, a very young age. Some of them can be quite elusive. Some of them can be very hard to get to know. Um, others we get to know through other means. They're always part and parcel of our life. Let's think about the lion, for instance. I remember as a child going to Trafalgar Square and peering up at those marvelous bronze Lancia lions, those symbols of strength in Trafalgar Square. It was many years later that I got to meet a real lion in the flesh. In fact, for some period of time, I helped hand rear two pairs of lion cubs that had been abandoned. So I'm very fortunate. I've spent quite a bit of my time, despite having grown up in the UK, not famed for its diversity of big cats, but working with these animals. And at the moment, my partner and I are involved with a charity which rescues big cats from European circuses where unfortunately they've been abused. And our mission is to give them a safe, secure, happy, uh, forever home where they can live out the rest of their lives, enjoying themselves with top quality veterinary care and some of the comforts that they never previously had. The Wild Heart Trust does that work. What is it about these animals that we find so entrancing? Well. I've heard tigers regularly described as nature's greatest masterpiece, and few would challenge that. They're huge predators. They are exquisitely beautiful. There is no doubt about that. Each one individually marked with that pattern of stripes around its head. But our tigers are in trouble, of course, like so many of our larger species of cats. In our overcrowded world, there's less and less space for them. And as we'll touch on later, I'm sure there were other more insidious reasons why they are still being poached and killed in various parts of, of parts of the world. I've been very fortunate. I've seen tigers in the wild. Um, I shall never forget my first encounter with a wild tiger. It was something quite special. I was there with my stepdaughter and we traveled to Bandavgarh in India. And I was, wow, must have been in my forties. And uh, I find that, Interesting. Someone, I mean, I was interested in wildlife when I was like four months old. Certainly by four years old, my you know, bookshelf was covered in books and many of them about the world's largest predators. But I had to wait until I was 40 to see one of them in the wild. It's a telling, it's an indictment of the fact that these animals are so inaccessible. And that's why things like Nat Geo World's Big Cat Week is so important. It gives us the ability to transport ourselves to the other side of the world um, and see these animals going about their natural behavior. And I've got to say, as I said at the outset, the films that we're going to be looking at are, are remarkable. There's some very, very strong sequences. They're beautifully made, great pieces of television. But also, if you're a naturalist, they're the sorts of things you can watch almost as if you're an observer, as if you're there watching them through your binoculars or sometimes even closer. And many of the films set the animals in context. They don't just tell you about the species, they tell you about its environment, the ecosystems where it lives, all of the other animals that it interacts with. But you know, perhaps the key strength of Nat Geo Wild's Big Cat Week this year and the selection of films they've made is their truth. They present the unadulterated truth about the way that these animals struggle to live, even without the negative influence of man. It's, it's tough being wildlife out there. It's tough finding food, finding a territory, finding mates, bringing up your, your cubs and getting them to an age where they survive to breed too. And that comes over in the films. The films also give us an opportunity to meet the animals as individuals. So we're not just talking about leopards or lions or snow leopards or tigers. We get to know each one of them. We get to understand things about their personality. We see that personality on screen. And I like that very much because I think there is a tendency for people to imagine that other species of animals other than ourselves all come out of the mold and that they're all identical. But of course they don't. They all have their little nuances of behavior 
and characteristics which are peculiar to them. And that's why I'm really pleased that tonight we're going to be joined by Beverly and Derek Joubert. And they've made one of the most fabulous films uh, about a leopard. And it's a leopard that they know well, they know it intimately. And that intimacy, as I've mentioned, comes over in their film. There's a very powerful connection that you can sense between the filmmakers and the animal. And they tell their story of this jade-eyed leopard, as it's called, over a period of three years. Now imagine that, imagine knowing a leopard, a wild leopard, for three years and being able to follow it and watch it grow, watch it fail, watch it succeed, watch it flourish, an individual and very, very beautiful animal. And we'll be having a chat with Beverly and Derek about that and their aspirations for future films and things that they're working on at the moment in a little while. But before we get to them, just a couple of other things I'd like to tell you about. And, and that is Nat Geo's Big Cats initiative, which was inaugurated. In fact, Derek and Beverly were involved in, in that initiative from, from the outset. And it's run by National Geographic Society. And it's a conservation initiative designed to halt the decline of big cats in the wild. And another thing you'll, you'll learn when you're watching the films this week is that Unfortunately, as I've said, you know, many of these animals are threatened for all sorts of reasons, but we do have a toolkit. We do have the ability, the energies, the know-how to put things right. It's not a lost cause, but we do have to get on with it. And that's what the Big Cats Initiative run by Nat Geo Society is all about. So I would urge you to go to natgeo.org slash big cats, natgeo.org slash big cats to find out all of that about that initiative and how you can help contribute to the preservation of these extraordinary animals. Uh, just a little bit before we get to uh, Beverly um, and Derek, a whole host of films coming up this week. Uh, the Jade Eyed Leopard we're about to see a little clip from and, and, and talk about. Um, then we've got Leopard Legacy, it's another extraordinary film. Diary of a Teenage Leopard, there's quite a lot of leopard action. Leopards are fantastic animals, I know you're going to enjoy all of those. And then we move to a slightly snowier leopard. Um, it's a snow leopard. Um, one of the most inaccessible animals on the planet. I mean, I remember going to the Himalayas in the 1990s and uh, meeting a scientist who'd been studying these animals for years and barely seen them. It's only in recent times that we've been able to see them on camera traps, given that technology had evolved, and then film them, and, and more recently travel to see them. And in fact, the last trip that I made prior to lockdown in January of last year, was to Ladakh in India to see snow leopard. And I don't want to brag or come over as smug because um, I'm neither a braggart nor a smug person, but we saw them. We saw two females with three cubs each and then with a tinge of smugness, we saw one of those adult females catch and kill an ibex. Now, I can't really tell you how that made me feel. I grew up in a world where snow leopards were so far away from me. They were so inaccessible. I never dared imagine that I might be able to travel to that part of the world to see these animals that exist at such low densities in such a hostile environment. I mean, it was beyond a dream come true. And since last January, I've repeatedly been pinching myself because I can still barely imagine that I, I, I went there and I, and I saw that. The, the film that's made about snow leopards is, is remarkable, absolutely remarkable. Uh, drone footage of these animals, setting them in that context. And then starting tonight, and I'll tell you more about it at the end, um, Cecil, Legacy of a King. Uh, Cecil the lion is an animal that was known, is known globally. Um, a very famous individual that tragically met an end um, due to trophy hunting, but opened a huge discussion not only about trophy hunting and lion conservation, but about the way that we treat our wildlife globally and the way that we need to change that in order to make sure it exists in the future. Um, if you've got any questions, please, this is a Facebook Live, we're live, and obviously um, we would be very keen to see your questions, so do send those in. Questions, I'll try and answer some, but direct them 
at uh, Derek and Beverly too. They certainly know their cats it's more intimately than, than I do and when it comes to leopards, for sure. So do send those questions in. That would be absolutely fantastic. Um, so before we, uh, we meet the filmmakers, let's take a, a little look at a clip of their extraordinary work. This is a, a short clip which will give you a taster of the jade-eyed leopard. Take a look at this. Rain in Africa is both a gift and a danger. The trick is in deciding which it is today. Fig doesn't have the luxury of using the opportunity now. If Toto gets confused or even adventurous, she'll wander off and the rain will wash her scent away. Fig must get back, quickly. Instead of staying safely under cover, Fig makes another decision that may be wise or fatal. What did I tell you? What did I tell you? You get a sense there of that intimacy that I was talking about. And the wildlife filmmakers that craft these sorts of films are remarkable in the breadth of their skills. Yes, they've got to be camera operators. Yes, they've got to be brilliant naturalists. You don't just go out into the bush and find the same leopard for three years nonstop. They've also got to be artists too, to craft these stories together and share them with us. Um, and that's why I'm so pleased that now we can be joined by Beverly and Derek Joubert from South Africa to tell us a little bit about how they've made this wonderful film that you're going to get to see a bit later in the week. Beverly and Derek, are you there? Hello, Hello Chris. Chris. How are you? All of those things you were saying about all those talents that we must have, you were clearly talking about Beverly. I'm simply the butler here. So, uh, no, thank you. Good to see you again, mate. And you. I hope you're both well in these troubled times. Um, it's not been an, an easy year for, for anyone on this planet. It's good to see you both well there. Um, I, I'm going to hand over to you to tell us a bit about what you've been up to. In the meantime, hopefully some questions will come in. And then uh, when you've told us a little bit about this story and your story, we can, uh, we can catch up and I'll ask you some of those questions. How's that sound? Fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. And uh, we will see you later, but uh, in the meantime, we can possibly run some images from this production. Yeah, but first of all, let us thank, um, you know, the National Geographic Facebook Live. Thank you very much for inviting us. I mean, it really is wonderful to be able to connect to somebody around the world. We really do appreciate that. And, uh, and then, of course, to Nat Geo um, Channel, Nat Geo Wild Channel, for airing and illuminating the Jade Eyed Leopard. So we started this production primarily by accident. We came across, we came across this little leopard under one of our tents. And usually we prepare for a show, we, we plot it out, we research it, and, and she just arrived in our lives. And then, as you said, Chris, the, uh, took us on event, an adventure for three years. Um, and it was really a coming of age film where we followed her from very young up until uh, just in fact a couple of weeks ago when we left. Absolutely. And uh, when we left um, uh, in, in late December, we actually came across her mother, Fig, and you, you will obviously meet all the characters. The mother's name is Fig. She reclines in um, a fig tree. And uh, she was once again um, a mother, a new mother. She had given birth uh, at, in one of our camps. So we've got um, uh, Great Plains Conservation. It is um, tourism to be able to protect the area, to protect leopards. And the first uh, time she gave birth was when we started the film Jade Eyed Leopard. And that was under one of um, our tents. That was tent five, wasn't it? 
Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah, and and now she's just given birth in Mara Plains, um, and I believe it was 10-7, uh, the honeymoon suite. That's right. So it has been this long adventure, but um, we've we've done films with leopards before, and uh, in fact, the the entire Big Cats initiative that Chris was talking about earlier on was born out of a leopard film. We got to know a leopard called Lachadima in Botswana, and that started us going to the National Geographic, primarily because during the four-year period of time that we worked with Lachadima, um, 10,000 leopards were killed, legally and illegally, and we knew that these big cats needed a voice. They needed our films, they needed what we could bring for them to the world. And um, Lakadima at the time has an incredible personality and she basically seduced um, Derek and I to be her voice. And so we have um, spoken out about leopards when you know that 60 years ago uh, there were um, 700,000 leopards and now they're less than 50,000 and definitely de um, you know, on the decline because 75% of their historic range has been taken away. And so that that is us slowly um, strangling uh, the areas where leopards can reside. And so it's very important for us, not only through our films, but in the core of everything Derek and I do is we speak out about conservation in every way, through our films, through our books, and, and through uh, the, the Great Plains um, conservation. It really is, to, we hope, that the films will touch your heart by watching her incredible story. And Jadeid Leopard is a remarkable leopard. She is an individual personality and she has a lot of charm. I mean, there were one or two moments in the film where she absolutely amazed us. And of course, curiosity of a cat always comes out, but we had never ever seen a leopard go up into a hummercorp's nest and actually turn it into her play field for the whole day until she eventually reclined right in the nest. And so this was the first time, we know that in, in the UK everybody loves birds, but this is the first time that we had a leopard bird in a nest. And you know, you just have to look into the eyes of these big cats, like, like this behind us here. Um, and, and you simply cannot fall in love faster. Um, these animals seduce you, as Beverly said, they draw you into their lives. And even as Chris said earlier on, they are personalities. And I think that over the 35 years or more that we've been doing our films, we've from the earliest time looked into ways on, on how to draw out those personalities and those characters. And, um, and I think that only by touching somebody's heart can you really get to their mind and then turn them into conservationists. So we're thankful for that and to the National Geographic Society for giving us that platform that we've so, uh, so needed over the years. Absolutely. And uh, the challenges that we had out there um, are very similar to many of the films that we've made. Obviously, um, the elements, incredibly hot, driving flowers, mosquitoes, but torrential rains. We didn't expect to have torrential rains because most of the time, uh, you know, working and filming um, in southern Africa, we don't have rains um, as um, the, the Mara does, the Maasai Mara, and sometimes it's 200 days in a year. So getting stuck in mud was probably top on the list. Um, and then, of course, not expecting uh, the river to rise to the point. I mean, what is that gorge? That gorge is about... You know, 10 metres, you know, yeah. 30 feet or so. Yeah. And for it to rise and totally take out our camp uh, was totally unexpected as well. So we had to... Uh, go downstream and trade with the Maasai that had picked up a lot of um, the equipment <laughs> further downstream. Not that everything was okay, um, but at least uh, that was part of the story. In fact, we even had a baby hippo that was caught um, in the camp um, because he had been washed up and he, he was a newborn. Uh, so we managed to relocate this little hippo as well once the floods had gone down. But the the behind the scenes, the things that we do on these productions 
uh, is very seldom understood by, the, by most people. Um, I believe that we shot nearly 2,000 hours of footage to produce one hour for you. Um, and that doesn't mean that, the, that everything else is rubbish. It's just selecting that, that crystallization of a story of a coming of age of a leopard. Um, you know, we just found the very best that we could. The other thing that we had a lot of fun with on this was actually getting a thermal camera and getting in, into the nighttime without any lights whatsoever and really lifting that veil into the, what goes on at night with these, these big cats. And, and then also, um, it's normally Derek and I in the field, but it was great to be able to, you know, welcome in a, a crew as well to assist us um, with the night work and, and various other aspects of it. So, in fact, um, while we continue to talk, perhaps we can show you a two or three minute clip of uh, behind the scenes of what we had to go through uh, and some of the great moments that, uh, that come from this film, Jade Art Leopard. We live in the most extraordinary place, following stunning big cats. Cats that move like silk, dropping out of the sky. And of course, I do it in the company of the most beautiful woman on earth. What could be better? <laughs> well, how about finding a leopard in its first days of life? We spend days tracking an animal from dawn to dusk without succeeding. So when we do find a leopard, it's like finding a precious gem in the grass, a vital piece in this vast landscape. In this case, the Mara ecosystem in Kenya. For our latest film, that gem was a mother leopard called Fig. She moves like liquid gold. And what she took us to was straight back to our camp, Morototo. We're underneath the deck, a week old jade eyed leopard. was a three-year journey with these two from the moment the river flooded their den through their grand adventures until she, still with extraordinary eyes, came of age. So, how are those eyes, Chris? Unbelievable, eh? Um, Hi. Yeah, no, those eyes are looking beautiful. What a stunning, stunning little leopard. Superb stuff. Absolutely superb. We've had a whole host of questions in, um, so brace yourselves. I'm going to save the very, well, the impossible one until last. Um, and I'd like to start off, if I may, and I know you've, you're, you, you won't disagree, with the questions that have come in from younger viewers. So I'm just going to flick them up on my screen here. We've got a few and we can 
get through these ones. So the first one, it's a bit of a leopard biology question. Um, Bertie, age 10, Humphrey, six, and Percy, three, have asked, how long is the usual life expectancy of a leopard? It's interesting because the leopard, Lachadima behind us, we lost her when she was about 13 years old. Uh, and we found her when she was eight days old. So we have a very, very good handle of her lifespan and progress. Yeah, and, and it really is about 15 years in the wild. You know, leopards could live longer in the zoo uh, because there they've been protected and um, they don't have the same challenges that, you know, that face them in the wild. Uh, in the wild, they truly um, are on a day-to-day -day, uh, being challenged by other predators. So sometimes their lives can and be, you know, even shortened. Got another one here from Willow, aged seven. Uh, it's a personal one. Uh, why did you choose to work with animals? Um, well, when we met in high school and fell in love in high school, and um, Beverly was such a wild animal then, I just decided <laughs> to, to dedicate my career to understanding wild animals like Beverly. <laughs> Um, now, the truth of it is that uh, we both grew up in Africa and wild animals were part of our lives from, from when we were very, very young. Uh, I never, ever for a moment thought that I would choose a career that didn't involve wild animals. Got one here from Frank, age 10. Um, what's the most elusive cat you've ever seen? Now, he hasn't said big cat because some of the small cats that are, can be even more elusive, certainly some of the African species, can't they? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, we started off uh, working with lions um, probably in the early 80s um, at night time. And at that time, we felt that leopards were the most elusive and didn't make a leopard film until about 2003. So for us, definitely leopards uh, fell right into that. But if you think of the little cats, probably the most elusive is the black-footed cat. And in fact, just about, uh, about a month ago, we were out looking and working with cheetahs and came across a serval, a beautiful female serval, and she gave us three or four hours of her time, and, and we've never had that before. Those servals are absolutely stunning, long-legged, big-eared, like stalking through the long grass, don't they? And they are remarkably adept at jumping up to catch birds in flight. Really yeah sharp senses the serval has but as you say really really tricky to watch i've got another one here it may come from a young person I haven't specified their name but it's asking for advice in that direction from damon and um, they've asked what advice would you give to younger aspiring wildlife photographers to carry with them into the future well i think we may have different advice but the, with technology today you can do a very very good wildlife film natural history film on your cell phone and so don't get caught up with the technology. Don't save up all your creative ideas until you can buy a decent camera. Shoot it on your camera and shoot it locally. There's fantastic things going on, as you and I were talking, Chris, early on, bird life in, in the UK. Uh, a lot of the stuff is happening in your backyard. So I'd say don't let technology get in the way. Don't even let travel get in the way. Go out there and do it. Absolutely. And um, passion, obviously, is key. Uh, but I pre presume if they're asking a question, they've already got the passion. So um, ignoring that part of it and saying, you know, uh, what we all have to do is start speaking out. So look at a cause that you feel very strongly about that is related to wildlife, to our planet, or to the area that they're already you know, wanting to connect. We found in our, early on in our careers that it wasn't enough just to uh, portray and illuminate an animal, but we wanted to be their voice, their messenger, uh, because they are um, in trouble right now. And so taking on a cause is vital. Be passionate. Okay. A, a very important question, this one from Asia. Um, are there lots of women in the wildlife filmmaking industry? 
Well, yes, there are. And um, it's in very encouraging to see that many more women are going out into the field. And when I say into the field, it's also through our Big Cat initiative at National Geographic. When we started it in 2009, you know, we said this is an emergency intervention. Um, Let's take action now because the cats are in trouble. And we didn't expect to get so many women. I think actually we've probably got three quarters of the grantees are women. Uh, they're passionate about it. They are really the nurturer. But they're out um, in the field all taking on projects that are working very closely with the communities. They created a, a wonderful education side of it as well as bringing the communities in who are now becoming the future conservationists um, in each and every area. And by the way, this is in 27 countries in Africa. There are no barriers in this industry for women. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I thought I lost you for a moment there. Um, I, just from my experience on some of the programs that I work on, more than 50% of the team, not necessarily always behind the camera, but the team are women. So there are lots of opportunities from across the, you know, the program making spectrum there um, to engage. I and mean, we certainly want full equality in our business. There's no doubt about that at all. Uh, Yankee has asked, how do you get so close to the animals? Um, well, there's a variety of techniques, but mostly we don't get that close. Um, so I use a 50 to 1,000 millimeter lens. And so on average, we're about 30 paces or 50 paces away from the leopard, unless she chooses or a leopard chooses to come closer to us. So in actual fact, our job is to stand back, not get that close, and to be as invisible as possible. We actually often have this mantra where we say that, if an animal is doing something and it stops and looks at us because we're too close or we've made a noise, then we've failed once. And if it starts interacting with us, running towards us or running away from us, then we've failed a second time. So close is not necessarily a qualifier. And intervening, we really will not intervene if it's a natural situation. So even though little Toto, um, you know, had a... a Toto and the mother, um, they could have been washed away with that flood, but we couldn't do anything about it. We had to just wait and watch. And in fact, she was more alert than we were. She heard the floods coming and she rescued little Toto. In the meantime, uh, Derek and I was, you know, still um, quite stunned uh, that the camp was going to be washed away. I'm glad you answered that question because it's one that came in from Wilson on Facebook. He, he said, if you were filming and you saw an animal in trouble, would you intervene? But you've, you've, you've answered that one. Another quick one for you here from Freya, age 12, again on Facebook. How fast can leopards run? Well, it is interesting. There's always a sort of myth about them running at about 35 miles an hour on the charge. Um, but it's quite hard to track that. And they run for very short bursts. And so it's an explosion of, of speed as opposed to a cheetah that uh, actually walks out in open. We've just been filming cheetahs actually, cheetah walking out into the gazelle and then just turns it on and they, then they're doing 70 miles an hour for quite a long, long run actually. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so leopard's uh, main tactic is to be elusive, to be um, solitary in the forest and to silently go through the forest so nothing else sees it. As soon as one of the other animals call, calls out, you can see that the leopard is irritated because now there's that warning sign and all the animals listen to those alarm calls. It's remarkable how they do, but a vivid monkey will call and then a baboon will start calling and the squirrels will. And so you can follow the course of the leopard all the way down the forest. And so that doesn't help. They really do need to hide, just wait, and often they'll leap out of an area. So it's quite often, it's funny, we often laugh because we'll be with a leopard and she'll be stalking through this forest and you catch a, a paw going down or a shoulder blade moving through the foliage. And then all of the stuff that Beverly's talking about starts to happen and then a guinea fowl steps out. And the leopard in particular, Toto, will just say, oh, damn it. And then she starts growling and hissing and her tail goes up and, and marches off and throws all her toys out the cot. 
got one here from Emma. You've touched on this because you've spoken about your own motivation in, in having a cause. Um, and she has asked, photo, well, she said, photojournalism, documentary and filmmaking play a huge role in highlighting the desperate situation our planet is in. With regards to the world of big cats, how has their decline impacted on your work? Do you think that the media is doing all it can or is there still more that can be done? It's a good question, Emma. And yeah. the real thing is that um, our filmmaking careers went through a couple of phases. At first, we fell in love with it. We wanted to celebrate it. But very quickly, we knew that there was a decline in these big cats. We spoke about the leopard numbers. But when we were born, there were 450,000 lions and today 20,000 lions. So we've lived through this massive, massive decline. And so we decided to use our voice and our, and our craft filming to, to speak out about that. Um, but the declines continue. And so the real answer is, no, we're not doing enough. Media is not doing enough about it. This should be front page of every newspaper every day, that the, the biodiversity of the planet is disappearing. And some days that makes me really angry. And then on other days, I think back to the Cecil the Lion incident, where a single lion gets shot by a safari hunter and the world explodes. And so we're in a new era now where if you use your voice in social media or, or write about it or photograph it, photojournalism, film, you can make a difference. And it's, right now is the time that we all need to be conservationists. We can't um, intro, introduce ourselves and say, well, I am a conservationist because this is my job. I do believe that each and every one of us on the planet needs to start um, understanding whatever uh, situation that they put out, there's going to be that cause and effect. And we are harming the planet. So we need to speak out. We need to also be talking to governments. Uh, they are the decision makers, uh, they create policy, but are they creating the right policy? Do they have all the right information? And so looking at that, let's give them the right information. Let's lobby against um, trophies being taken um, across the world, you know, from Africa to, to America. Uh, we shouldn't have um, endangered species in wet markets. Uh, who knows uh, if that is, um, you know, where this pandemic has started. And should we really be putting animals in inhumane situations anyway? It doesn't seem right that minks have been, you know, on cages one on top of the other, and now they're having to be, you know, to be killed. So. Our whole philosophy is um, as much communication as we can, get it in the media, uh, you know, as, as quickly as possible when there's a negative situation, but use your voice in every way, whether you're making films or on social media, use your voice. And don't forget to also, from the origins, um, celebrate these magnificent animals. Um, I think that sometimes we get wound up in, in the, um, the stuff that we do in speaking about the atrocities and uh, it's always worthwhile circling back and just saying why we're protecting these animals. They're magnificent. It's an absolute miracle that they exist. I think you've answered a couple of questions, but I'll acknowledge them. James and Julia have both asked, what practical steps can people take to mitigate the issues impacting on wildlife? What can they do to really make a difference? And you've nailed it there. It's get involved. Use whatever platform you have, whether you're a filmmaker or you're on social media, to communicate with that community of like-minded people who share your passion. And Beverly's just been sharing that passion uh, with everyone, of course, um, and that's part and parcel of the modern world. I remember only a few days after Cecil had been killed by that trophy hunter that when I looked on a search engine, I found that there were 20 million pages with his name in uh, around the world. You know, that, that lion and his plight was communicating globally thanks to the power of social media. So it's it's actually a very important conservation tool now, isn't it? It really is, and we have to use it. And it's part and parcel of solving one of the three big issues with conservation. The first is ignorance. Um, people do not know that killing a lion or hunting or um, trading in rider horn, whatever, is, is, is a bad thing. So we have to collectively, those of us who know, fight that ignorance with knowledge. 
And uh, for those people who can't write a check to the Big Cats Initiative, um, becoming informed and then spreading that knowledge is vitally, vitally important. The second pillar of the one of the big conservation evils is uh, necessity. So there are communities that live across the world very close to these natural habitats that are struggling to find out to, to get the meal, their meal for the next day. They don't know where that's coming from. And so it's our collective duty to raise people up, to spread benefits and to get them off that poverty line. And various people around the world will have different um, interests and, and uh, abilities to do that. And the last is greed. So while we've got, uh, we know if we erode ignorance and, and people know that it's a bad thing to, to shoot a leopard or a lion or a rhino, and if they don't have to do it for tomorrow's meal and they do it anyway, that's pure evil and greed. And those people need to be pointed out. Okay, but coming towards the end, I have got the two trickiest questions that I'm saving right, right to the last, but um, we've got one here from James. Uh, it's a pertinent question. What is the single biggest issue facing African wildlife right now? Well, it would be those three things, but I think that it's the human wildlife conflict. I think that these big iconic creatures are getting squeezed out of the landscape. It is. Recently, I was working on, a, on another initiative, which was about building a waterhole in an area which was very dry. Um, and one of the purposes behind this project was to see whether we could draw uh, wild animals, principally elephants, of course, away from human sources of water where that human wildlife conflict constantly arises. So we were interested to see if we could provide permanent water uh, in the form of a waterhole to basically prevent the animals straying to those sources where humans are also equally thirsty in the dry season, of course, um, but coming into conflict with that. And with Africa's growing human population, those sorts of projects and, and that sort of research, I think, is, is, is really important. Okay. The, the, but Chris, if I may add there, um, right now I think this pandemic could be the biggest um, issue for wildlife in Africa because what has happened, all these areas have been protected through various forms. Governments have protected them. There have been national parks. Um, the, the income comes through tourism. But once the pandemic hit in March when all the um, African borders were closed, that shut down tourism. That shut down a valuable economy to the country. And now people are questioning, you know, why should we have wildlife when we could have cattle, we could do, be doing agriculture? Uh, so when you think of 2019, it was around about a $50 billion industry for the whole of Africa with tourism once again, and now it's zero. Uh, in March, we started a project, another emergency project that National Geographic is supporting called Project Ranger. And Project Ranger is to try and keep all the frontline people, men and women, uh, in the field. Many of the governments uh, furloughed the rangers. Many of the organizations didn't have money to pay for those rangers. And so we're raising funds to keep those rangers in the field so that we're not only protecting uh, the wildlife, but we're also protecting their future bank. The, com the communities that relying on wildlife through tourism uh, will have nothing after this pandemic if those people aren't in the field. And we have seen um, right through Africa an escalation on the bushby trade. Mm. Yes, I, I, it's something that's been on our minds from the outset. Uh, I have a couple of friends who have uh, business interest in ecotourism. And of course, they've had a, a really rough time. But as you say, those animals, those ecosystems, um, that, that's the bank for these communities in the future. And one has to hope that there's enough cash left in that bank so that that system can be rebuilt. There's no doubt about that at all. OK, the tricky ones. Are you ready? The first one, each of you should answer each of these questions just um, because they are tricky. Um, bucket list. Which species, let's make it an African one, uh, which African species haven't you seen but you m would most like to see? And that's some, uh, Mike has sent that one in on Facebook. 
Very, very quickly, snap decision, bonobos. Oh, gosh, that's a great one. And orangutans on my part. Oh, <laughs> Other than, of course, if they're not in <laughs> Africa, oh, you put that on to me. I have um, spent time with gorillas and absolutely love it. Um, gosh, an utopia. No, I'm not too, okay, and probably in a carpi. Yeah. A carpi. I'd have gone for a carpi as well, I think. Yeah extraordinary animals i've seen them in captivity and that beautiful sort of purplish sheen on their pelage is really quite something and those lovely banded legs and then of course when they extrude their remarkable tongue that lilac tongue that slides out and out and out so long for wrapping around the foliage that they eat. the idea of seeing an okapi in the wild well that's right up there with snow leopard isn't it anyway look here we are this is the most difficult question it's been asked by jeff it's normally Asked, but Jeff may well be a young person. It's normally asked by a young person, What is your favorite big cat and why? And you have to pick one. Well, well, that's a hard one because I we thought were... it was the most difficult question. <laughs> but I, I have to say, um, right now, you know, with jade eyed leopard just uh, being uh, with leopards again, and then the experience that we had with this leopard behind us truly changed our lives in so many ways. Uh, she was our teacher um, in, in every way possible. So definitely leopards. There is nothing, leopards aside, to compete with a big male lion strutting through the dawn with the dawn mist moving out as he roars into the African landscape. So you could roar for them now. <laughs> tough question, really tough question. Yes. Okay. So you've gone for leopard and lion. So just before we wrap up, um, we're obviously going to see Jade Eyed Leopard uh, tomorrow evening. That's going to be available on that Geo Wild, of course. That'd be fantastic. Uh, what are you working on at the moment? Well, ironically, we've just been up there right now, and, and that's why we're able to see Fig and, and uh, Toto. But we're doing a film a special for National Geographic on cheetahs in the Mara. And again, we've done a number of lion films and another a number of leopard film, elephant film and rhino films, but never cheetahs. And so this is a new experience for us. And uh, it's been very, very interesting because, you know, Chris, I always say this, leopard smile. Um, but cheetahs don't. And so it's been quite hard to reach in and to find those personalities for me as I write it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Derek mentioned earlier that uh, we've been looking at um, our older films from the 80s and 90s. And this seems to be a time to reflect at what's happened to those areas and is that behavior still happening? So we are taking six of those films and, um, and bringing them out in, in a way that I suppose is, um, you know, just adding that added information of the, the then and the now. Interesting stuff. And one thing before we go, because we really must drive people to take a look. Um, the Nat Geo Big Cat Initiative, um, we've already mentioned the website, natgeo.org slash big cats. Um, it's a fantastic program of projects designed to look after these animals. I think whilst many people know about the plight of tigers, because it's been very well documented for a long time, not so many people are probably aware well, they might be after this week, of course, that's part and parcel of Nat Geo's mission. It's not just to show us beautiful pictures, but to educate as well. But leopards and lions in Africa are in desperate trouble too, aren't they? So since we were born, and we'll give you the numbers, both of them have gone down 95%. Mm -hmm. So the lion numbers, as I said earlier, when we were born, 450,000 down to 20,000. The leopard numbers were... 700,000 have gone down to, to less than 50. But one that's even more alarming are cheetahs. They've gone down to under 7,000. Shocking stuff, isn't it? Shocking stuff. So please do visit that website and take a look at that stuff. Uh, Derek, Beverly, what a privilege, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for not only giving us the remarkable film, which we can all enjoy tomorrow, but also your time this evening to tell us about your experiences. I'm sure a lot of people have been left envious of your encounters of these animals, but then they're not the ones setting the alarm clock at 2.30 in the morning or digging their 
you know, four, four out of the mud on the Mara. <laughs> People must realize that um, whilst the product that comes from your lenses and your skills and artistry is always very beautiful, behind it, there's some good, solid, hard work, isn't there? Well, there is, Chris. And of course, I'm only 25 years old and look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Superb. Thanks so much for joining us. Okay, all the Thanks. best, good Chris. Thank you. you. Good luck with it. Stay, stay safe. Look after yourselves. Fantastic. What about that? That was good, wasn't it? Really good. Literally from the lion and leopard's mouth about the making of that remarkable film. Well, we're going to have to wrap things up now. I cannot urge you enough uh, to visit that website. Please do take a look, natgeo.org slash big cats. Um, look at that initiative. Lots of information there. Uh, and, and of course, ways that you can join in and, and help the plight of these animals as well. I implore you to do to devote as much time as you can this week to watch the programs in this year's Big Cat Week. It's it's a super sh a set of shows. I'm just going to run through a few of them as well. We've heard about Jade Eyed Leopard. Jade Eyed Leopard is on tomorrow night at nine o'clock on Nat Geo Wild TV, of course. Um, then we've got Leopard Legacy, um, the lives of, th of several leopards, actually, again, filmed over three years, a bit later in the week. Diary of a Teenage Leopard speaks for itself, of course. Uh, the leopard here is taking, um, I want to say, like many teenagers of the human kind, he's lingering at home for a little longer than perhaps he should. The Frozen Kingdom, the show, snow leopard I've already mentioned, extraordinary photography, but again, an insight into the family lives of these animals with some beautiful, beautiful pictures of them in that remarkable landscape. And then if you're into animal behaviour, um, something I was unaware of, I'm not sure how many times it's been documented, we have a film called Leopard versus Hyena Strange Alliance. Um, it is a strange alliance. Leopards and hyenas are invariably arch enemies. The hyenas do their best to steal as much of the leopard's prey as if they possibly can. However, this young hyena, a male, and you might know that he, hyenas have uh, female-dominated societies, and the, you wouldn't argue with a female hyena, even if you were a male hyena. He's driven out of his clan, as we call them, and he finds a unique way of surviving which means sharing his time and space with a leopard. And this exemplifies what I was saying at the outset about the quality of these films and the way that they give us an insight into personal relationships and the intimacy of those is, is, is quite fantastic. Serengeti Speed Queen, I bet you can guess what that's about, it's cheetahs, uh, uh, of course. And again here, uh, the truthful tale of Nzuri, uh, a female cheetah trying to raise her cubs in, in that extraordinary environment where she's trying to catch prey, she's trying to protect them, the cubs, from being prey. It's a tough watch at times, but um, it has a, a very satisfying end, as does Tiger Queen of Taru. Um, here we're switching continents, going to the Indian subcontinent, um, to look at a female tiger who, again, is struggling to hold a range, rear her cubs. She's got all sorts of large, larger male tigers coming in as well, throwing their weight about quite literally. One of them throws its weight about with a, uh, a sloth or a sloth bear, um, which is quite something to behold. And then, of course, starting tonight um, at nine o'clock is Cecil, um, Legacy of a King, which tells the story from almost birth through to death of Cecil the Lion, one of the world's most famous big cats. Fantastic stuff. Don't miss out on all of that this week. I hope you've enjoyed um, joining us this evening and learning a little bit more about these animals. There's always more to learn. That's the greatest joy of Beverly's, Derek's, my job, everyone who's working at Nat Geo. Life is a learning experience for us. You think you know everything about leopards, you turn up one morning, one does something you just can't believe, like hanging out with a hyena, for instance. Anyway, from me, Chris Packham, uh, I'm going to say good night. Make sure you enjoy these programmes and check out that website. These cats need our help and we can all play a role, as Beverly and Derek have told us, we can all play a role and we need to play that role now. Some of us are taking a last stand for the world's wildlife and Nat Geo are at that forefront. Good night.